Oftentimes, when doing apologetics, you'll hear atheists and skeptics saying that Christians should not judge, because this is what Christ told us. How true is that? What does this even mean, and how to counter this argument? This and more in today's video. Every zealous and devout Christian has two tendencies in his heart. First one is to condemn the sin as something evil, which will eventually lead the sinner to eternal damnation. The second one is to show unbound charity towards the sinner and love them as God loves them. Those two, at first glance, seem contradictory, but in fact they are not. And so the biblical and truly Christian behavior would be to reconcile those two points of view, uh, which is exactly what the Bible teaches us. In fact, I like to argue with this notion that we should just love anyone as they are and uh, not pay attention to their wrongdoings. This is evil and this is contrary to the Christian definition of love. But before we get to that, let us make a distinction. There are three types of love. There is eros, which is a physical affection, or like a sexual love, towards your, wi your wife or husband. There is philos, which is a warm affection or friendship, so it's still a feeling, in a sense. But there is also agape, which is a sacrificial, unconditional type of love towards all people. And this is the love we should uh, have towards other people. But as Christians, we have a very clear definition of love. So, uh, it's not some emotion which will eventually pass like all other emotions. It's rather a, a rational act of will. So, we are willing the best for the person we love. And from this definition, we can derive uh, our behavior towards the sinner. Because... Uh, when we, when we define love as willing the best for the person we love, then it means we want the highest good for everyone. Okay, so what's the highest good for a person? It's obviously salvation. So we want everyone to get saved. And in order for them to get saved, they cannot be sinners, uh, especially m sin mortally. So, so we should love everyone with the agape type of brotherly love. And if somebody sins, we have to rebuke them in a respectful manner. So, notice how every time Christ meets a sinner, he, of course, forgives them, because they want to be forgiven, that's a very important part. But he also says, go and sin no more. So we have to encourage virtue, we have to encourage goodness in those people who sin. Of course, it's... Uh, it's motivated by nothing else but love. And we have to be uh, respectful, of course, to other fellow brothers and sisters. Okay, but this all might be a bit too abstract for now. So I have an example. Let's say you have a friend who is involved in homosexual acts, which is a sin that is very present in today's world. So the correct way to rebuke him is to say that you love him as a brother, and because you love this person, you want them to be saved, eternally. But they do things which are very evil and sinful. And this is why you beg them not to betray Christ, and come back to their senses, and sin no more. Good thing is to remember that you yourself are a sinner, even if not this kind of a sinner. So you still nail Christ to the cross by your sins. You're not any better. And he died for all of us, so always treat sinners the way you'd want to be treated. Now I'd want to share with you a few Bible verses about rebuking, which is telling people they're wrong and they're doing something evil. So, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 5. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. As for those who persist in sin... Rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. Revelation chapter 3 verse 19 
Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And one last verse about those who are not able to uh, stand being rebuked and corrected. Do not reprove a scuffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Okay, so what is the conclusion of all this? Well, the Bible teaches us that we can rebuke, we can correct, and reprove people who do wrong, because we don't want them to be damned for eternity. This is the biblical teaching, and there is no other biblical teaching. So what about the verse, judge not? Well, there are a couple of responses, but before we answer this objection, let me read the whole passage. So, judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So if we break this passage down, it becomes clear that Jesus was not telling his disciples they could never judge. Rather, he commands them to live righteous lives themselves, so their judgment wouldn't be rash judgment. Our Lord Jesus Christ even uh, expects his disciples to judge, but he warns them they will also be judged at the end times. Later, Jesus condemns hypocrisy. So if we uh, judge someone for the sin we are guilty of ourselves, we are acting in a hypocritical manner, which is bad, of course. Okay, but why do we interpret this passage this way? Is it because we like to judge? Are we trying to find excuses? No. It's because Jesus, for example, tells the Jews in uh, John chapter 7, verse 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So it's not about not judging, rather it's about judging unjustly. Also, uh, this judgment thing, we can have two judgments. First one is judging another's behavior, which is something we should do. It's encouraged if done in, uh, in a good and right way. But there is also the judging uh, of, the, of the soul, which is something only God will do at the end times, uh, during the final judgment. And this we also can do, of course. This is what Jesus tells us. Okay, but what do the saints tell us about this passage? First one is St. John Chrysostom, who sums it up pretty well. He says, What then? Ought we not to blame them that sin? How then does he say, elsewhere, reprove, rebuke, exhort, and them that sin rebuke before all? And how has he set over us so many to reprove, and not only to reprove, but also to punish? And how gave he them the keys also, since if they are not to judge, they will be without authority in any matter, and in vain have they received the power to bind and to lose? And besides, if this were to obtain, all would be lost alike, whether in churches, or in states, or in houses. Unless we judge our enemies, we shall never be able to put an end to our enmity. But all things will be turned upside down. What then can the saying be? In this place, then, as it seems at least to me, he does not simply command us not to judge any of men's sins, Neither does he simply forbid the doing of such a thing, but to them that are full of innumerable ills and are trampling upon other men for trifles. And I think that certain Jews too are here hinted at, for that while they were bitter, accusing their neighbors for small faults, and such as came to nothing, they were themselves insensibly committing deadly sins. So he confirms that Christ condemns hypocrisy here in this passage because there were many Jews who were judging small sinners uh, for their sins in a very uncharitable way despite being very sinful themselves. Cyril of Alexandria says, for although it becomes men to look into themselves and walk after God, 
This they do not, but look into the things of others, and while they forget their own passions, behold the infirmities of some, and make them a subject of reproach. So here again, he says we should not be hypocritical. Also, what does the Catechism of the Catholic Church teach us? Well, it says, He becomes guilty of rush judgment, who, even tacitly, assumes as true, without sufficient foundation, the moral fault of a neighbor. So let's say we have a, a neighbor who we think he sinned, but we don't have enough evidence. So if we assume that, we are guilty of rash judgment, and therefore we are sinners. And the next point in the Catechism is very, very important. So, to avoid rash judgment, everyone should be careful to interpret insofar as possible his neighbor's thoughts, words, and deeds in a favorable way. Every good Christian ought to be more ready to give a favorable interpretation to another's statements than to condemn him. But if he cannot do so, let him ask how the other understands it. And if the latter understands it badly, let the former correct him with love. If that does not suffice, let the Christian try all suitable ways to bring the other to a correct interpretation, so that he may be saved. This is brilliant. This is everything I told you so far. So let's uh, make it a bit more simple. So let's say you have, you have a neighbor uh, or somebody, anyone, who says, for example, things that you think might be heretical. So what do you do? You try to interpret it in the best way possible. If it's not possible, because those words really seem heretical, you ask him, what do you mean by that? Do you really mean this thing? If he says yes, correct him with love. If that doesn't work, try all other suitable ways to get him saved, to get him out of his error. So this is how Christians should behave, and this, this is not only about heresy, because it says all thoughts, words, and deeds. So this is how we should behave when we see our brother or sister in Christ sin. It became a tradition that I talk about rat trads and rant a bit, so let me do it now. All of you out there who judge the Pope in a very critical manner, you are breaking the law of the Catechism, if you're doing it rashly. Here is the lesson. Try to interpret Pope's words in the most favorable way possible, because this is what the Church teaches us to do. If it says we should treat everyone like this, how much charitable should we be to the Vicar of Christ, to Our Holiness the Pope? I also want to mention the specific virtue we need to make good judgments. It's the virtue of prudence. Quoting Aristotle recta ratio agibilium, which is right reason applied to practice. So by practicing and growing in the virtue of prudence, we get good at determining what is truly right or truly wrong. Prudence basically allows us to do things the right way. And as we grow in this virtue, we'll begin to notice how some people are not so good in this. So, this is when we start to judge uh, by rebuking them in a loving way. And this is what it's all about. Okay, now I'll try to do my best in summarizing what I just said, basically. For those who maybe didn't understand everything and want, like, the, the precise conclusion, how should they act? I tell you. You should judge actions, wrong actions, and not people. You should never condemn a person. Rather, in a loving way, tell them that they are wrong, that they are doing something which is very bad, blasphemous, or sinful. And you should always want them to change it. Go and sin no more. This is what Christ tells people. And this is what you should tell people too. Quit making fun of sinners, because it's a serious matter, it can get them to hell. Quit being uh, proud of yourself that you are not like them, because this is what the Pharisees did. You might be the instrument through which Christ wants to convert those people, so please act accordingly. But before I end this video, one last biblical verse, which I saved for the end of this video, simply because I wanted to uh, make it special, because it's a literal instruction. Listen to this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, 
take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. You see, sometimes uh, people are so deep in sin that you can do anything on your own and you can only pray. And this is the moment when you should distance yourself. This is what the Bible teaches you. And this is the end of today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope now you're able to counter this argument made by atheists against Christianity. And by doing so, defend your faith. Stay close to God, hold fast to tradition, and be brave. God bless you.